So two other topics I want to talk about, and we'll let you go. Um, I'd s the question is around what is market segment? What is our market segmentation? Um, I was asked that question, what my vision before was, and so uh, I think I sent both you and Jeremy a, a list of the market segments that I envisioned for as possibilities for us, uh, kind of an order of priority as to how we might want to grow this program. The first one being underserved community members who are riders and cannot pay due to financial hardships, and frankly, just need to get to the store, doctor, or whatever. That's the, right. ob that's the obvious one. Uh, the next one, and I call that, and they would be freebies, basically. The second one would be transportation challenge seniors or handicapped that we might want to provide free or discounted rates based upon their financial ability. So it's kind of the next tier up, so to speak. And okay. you showed me that those folks in Tennessee that are charging three bucks a ride, et cetera. So I get that. Then we get into right. like business medical establishments who are quote sponsors for their parents, uh, or for the, excuse me, for their patients or their customers so that they get rides to their facilities. For example, local nonprofits that are providing health uh, care to their constituents. And that those right. medical establishments, let's say, might pay full or whatever that full number is, or discounted based upon volume. What's your thoughts on that? Right. Um, well, I think that the landscape is that the shifting uh, a bit in that area, and what I mean is, um, uh, I believe that there's recently been some changes to um, Medicare where transportation is something that is covered. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, or maybe it's just Medicare. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but there seems to be, bottom line is, um, there, there's a little more interest on the part of medical institutions to try and solve the transportation issue because, frankly, um, you know, they get paid for every person who shows up for an appointment, right. and if the person doesn't show up, they don't get paid, and so... It's in their economic interest to try and um, support anything and you know within reason to uh, provide rides for people. Um, they up until recently they've always been a little bit hesitant about getting involved with that because they always perceive the liability issues bigger than the payoff issues, but that. Well, my perception is that that's beginning to change, and you may have more success talking to medical institutions about them, uh, you know, subsidizing uh, rides to their location. What's, and, the, what's and the liability? One of the that so, I think about, so what's the liability concerns? I was always a little bit stumped when they would come back with that, but uh, they just perceive it as once we go down this road of paying for rides, then somebody's going to find out that we were paying for this ride, and it, it was a ride provided by a 67-year-old guy that you know needed new glasses, and oh God, we're going to be the deep pockets, and so. We're going to be the ones that the lawyers are going to go after to, you know, make us pay for this, you know, this thing. I mean, it, it, I never thought it was much of an argument, but, you know, these big medical institutions have their own army of lawyers, and they all they see is, is liability, you know. They, they're scared to death of, uh, of their shadows in some cases, <laughs> my, my, my way of thinking but as I said, I, 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 I'm beginning to see a Boeing, uh, you know, a more, you know, no, we need to we need to address this transportation issue because, frankly, uh, you know, I, honestly, it's in their financial interest uh, 
to, to get people to their appointments. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I did talk about, which is uh, if you get far enough down this road working with medical institutions, there is a feature in assisted ride where imagine that you find a large medical institution that says, oh, yes, we want to play. We want to help subsidize the ride. We'll pay you X number of dollars for each ride. But can we schedule rides ourselves? And the answer is yes. We have designed into assisted rides a feature where imagine you combine, you create an area that represents this medical institution and you link all of your clients who are patients of doctors out of that medical institution to that area. And then we have a different kind of login, a provider, they're labeled a provider. And when a provider logs in, all they can do is view the patient of that medical organization and schedule a ride for that person to one of their locations. So imagine that a patient goes to see their doctor. Oftentimes the last thing the doctor says is, okay, I'd like to see you back here in two weeks. Go out to the receptionist and have her schedule next appointment. That receptionist would put it on the doctor's calendar and then flip over and submit the ride request on behalf of that client. So, and suppose, uh, let's say we were asking the, that particular organization to charge or pay $10 for that feature per, um, per client. Right. How would the hospital pay assisted rides, or more importantly, the nonprofit that's running the assisted rides software, 10 bucks. Well, we don't want to get involved in that uh, transaction. Um, but remember I showed you the uh, uh, destination report? You can run that every month. And it says, oh, last month there were if to rise to this organization, 52 times 10, send us a check for $520. Here's the report. That's the evidence of how much you should send us. Uh, we, we, we think that's something that, you know, the organization, the nonprofit organization using this rise would, would work out, um, you know, we, we're not involved in that transaction. I will tell you that we have instances Kind of turn this around a little bit. We have a uh, we have a number of instances where, um, let's say, there is a regional transportation agency uh, that is responsible for the fixed route bus service in the community. Uh, you know, and and and, and uh, but one of the things that these agencies are discovering is that these fixed route bus programs don't work for 92-year-old ladies that use a walker and would have to transfer twice in order to get to see their doctor. It just doesn't work anymore uh, with our aging population. And what I'm getting to is that we have a number of instances where our client is actually the regional transportation agency. They pay for assisted rides, and then they turn around and they give it away free to all of the nonprofits in the community that are providing rides because they subsidize those rides. And by use, having everybody use assisted rides, they know that um, it's always apple to apple. And if they don't get, you know, a report off of an Excel spreadsheet and another one from an access database and another one from whatever the case may be. So I'm only telling you that there are different models of how communities 
are approaching this, um, you know, that's another example where it, it, it works. So if you've got a fixed ride transportation system, mm -hmm. tell me again how that would operate with assisted rides through the local nonprofit. Well, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that um, it, it does, but one of the things that is happening is, is these regional transportation agencies who for decades have run fixed route bus service. That's their charter. That's what they do. They've been very happy doing that. But they find themselves going to meetings and they are being accosted almost by the fact that what are we doing to help provide transportation solutions for our senior population? We've got an aging population. They can't use the bus anymore. Uh, you know, what can we do for them? And so all that I'm saying is that this is something that some have adopted as a way of complementing their fixed route program. They pay for assisted rides. They give it away free to any nonprofit in the community that's providing rides, and then those programs and run reports at the end of the month and submit them to uh, the regional transportation agency showing this is how many rides we provided and the transportation agency, in some cases, pays them for the rides that they're providing. And that way, the regional transportation agency can then go back to the county supervisors or whoever it is that's been harassing them with these questions and say, this is what we're doing. We're putting in place this program. We're subsidizing these rides. We're, you know, we're using this assisted ride. So, you know, we're giving it away free to these organizations so they can schedule the ride, keep track of the mileage, keep track of the hours, and, and we, you know, we can subsidize these rides that they're providing. I'm only saying, you know, this is another phenomenon that we see. Uh, to, on Thursday, I'm going up to Sonoma County. Sonoma County is a client of ours. But Sonoma County, the county, doesn't use assisted rides itself. They've given a, they pay for it, but they give it away free to seven, I think it's seven different nonprofits in Sonoma County that provide rides. <laughs> and then they subsidize those organizations for the rides that they provide. Wow. And they want to be up and give them some on hand in you know in-house training so uh thursday i'm driving up there about an hour 20 minutes from where it is okay I'm only, you know this is an, an example of of another way that uh some communities are uh approaching this you bet all right so just continuing on back to the market segment conversation we talked sure. about business medical sure. establishments now how about just Drug stores and grocery stores who want to get their clients into their facilities in order to buy stuff and providing transportation on either a full price basis or discounted based upon volume. Have you had any experience with that? Drug stores and grocery um, stores. You know, what I, what, what I, when I go out and I talk to our clients, we talk about this, these kinds of things, um, I would say that First of all, it's, it's very spotty. It's very spotty. Uh, it's really difficult uh, in some cases to convince, you know, a Walmart or a Walgreens or whatever the popular grocery store in your area is, uh, Kroger's or Safeway or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. First, it's really difficult to get in front of the right person and explain what it is that you're talking about and get them to listen. Um, when it, but when you do, it, it usually translates into, oh, well, okay, we'll give you, you know, a thousand dollar grant. You know, we'll, we'll give you a check for a thousand dollars to help provide rides. And, and it's usually, I would say that it's usually not 
tightly coupled to how many rides we provide to your stores. It's more that you're making a pitch that, look, your grocery store chain, uh, this is something that you should do for the good of the community. And it turns out that you'll benefit from it because we will bring people to spend money in your stores. But I don't see a lot of evidence where it gets tightly coupled, you know, where, you know, here's a report, we provided 74 rides to bring people to your stores, therefore give us X number of dollars. It's usually a little softer than that, and it's usually, oh, I see. This is a good thing that you guys are doing, and okay, we'll give you uh, some money to sponsor your program, and come back next year, and we can have another conversation. And maybe at, when you come back, you, you show them, and look, we, you know, over the past year, you know, we we brought you know 272 people to your stores to spend money, and then they're, oh, well, okay, we'll give you some more money, but I don't see where it it it. Formalized. Let's put it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I was just curious. Fifth market yeah. segment is uh, churches to support rides for their yep. growing congregations. I mean, what's been in your experience yep. that you've seen for for churches utilizing this system? Well, you know, that, that, that's a good question. Um, one of the features in assisted rides is um, we actually, you can set up all of the congregations in your community, and then you can link clients and volunteers to the congregation where they attend service. And one of our, our, our thinking, the thinking is that, look, congregations can be a great source for both clients and volunteers, but they tend to be a lot more receptive to your story if you can show them that you're providing services for people of their congregation. So by being able to, we have week of reports that you can run to show how many rides were provided for people who attend this congregation. And conversely, how many rides did volunteers from your congregation because then when you go to them and you talk to them, they're a lot more receptive to, oh, you know what, we'll put a blurb in our newsletter at the end of the month about the program and, you know, we'll mention it from the pulpit uh, once a year or something, you know, that kind of thing. So we try and we've built into a system drive tools that try and help you connect with the congregations in your community and get them engaged in the process. But I have to say that I listen to clients all the time and I'm surprised sometimes they say, sometimes it's not as easy as it seems it should be. Um, I, I, I don't have a good, it, 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 it's like congregations have their own program. They have their own ideas of, you know, how to provide assistance for people they do it themselves or whatever and sometimes it's hard to get through to them that this is you know a good thing for your congregation um, it does happen it does work uh, it, there are success stories uh, I just want to also be very you know careful and not oversell it uh, you got to get them engaged in the program got it Last uh, two we got here real quick are just, uh, I mean, those, sure. those, that market segment for people that need a ride. Like if my wife wants to go to the drugstore as opposed to driving herself, she just wants to call up assisted rides you and know, somebody take her. Um, <laughs> you know, um, that's, the, the, the one drawback, or I would say drawback, but I'm not sure that's the right word, but um, you can see from what I've shown you in this ride that clients, there's a there's a profile and they're set up and it's and it's it, it's all 
done in advance. And, 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 and all that I'm saying is that this is not Uber where, you know, you as a, as a person can just download the Uber app on your phone and set up an account and 10 minutes later be ordering a car to come pick you up and take you to the grocery store. This is pre-planned. This is, you know, you, you know, these clients are interviewed. It, oftentimes, they have to meet certain criteria to be part of the program. Uh, they have to be entered into assisted rides. They, they, you know, there's there's a modicum of, of uh, work involved before that client can call for the first time and ask for a ride. So while, yeah, there is possibly is uh, an opportunity for just people who want rides, um, I kind of think that we're getting close to trying to be an Uber, and I'm not sure that's really the direction that, you know, we envision taking. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. Speaking of Uber, but I'll tell you, I'll give you a couple of ideas. I'll give you a couple of ideas of other market segments that uh, ultimately you could explore. One of them is um, one of the things that is also in your community that may be something ultimately you could explore is there are many people who get jobs and need transportation to get to their job. They got to you know, they're a dishwasher at a, you know, a restaurant that's 10 miles away from where they live, and the bus is going to take them an hour and a half to get that 10 miles. Gosh, is there any way that, you know, and there are some uh, social programs that pay to transport people to their job site. That's an opportunity. Um, another one, one I came across, we had an organization in Alaska, and in Alaska, um, if you are in the justice system for some reason, you are a parolee, and you need a ride to go meet with your parole officer, or you need a ride to go to AA uh, to, you know, meet the requirements of your parole, uh, uh, you know, you're supposed to attend AA meetings or something. Alaska has a program that um, these rides can be paid for. Um, and, uh, you know, and the whole point is to try and keep people successful, try and keep them uh, from getting in trouble again. Um, if you are in family court and you've been separated from your your kids, uh, you can get rides to go and you know be able to meet with your kids, things like that. So there are some interesting market segments out there. Um, that's, uh, great. that's, that's a great idea. idea. That's a great idea. Thank you. It not occurred right. to me. Uh, foster kids. Foster kids, we have a program in Oklahoma where it's used when foster, when kids are taken into the system, uh, many times uh, siblings will be broken up and sent to different foster homes simply because one foster home can't handle, you know, four kids from one family or something like that. And so there's a program where uh, there's an organization that provides rides for these kids so they can get together with their siblings. You know, three different volunteers will pick up a child each and bring them to an agreed upon park or something so that they can just, the kids can spend some time together. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, I, I, that's another fascinating one to me. Uh, it's, it's like the kind, it, that's the kind of thing where, oh my gosh, I would have never even thought about that. But sure, that makes sense, of course, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so. Okay. Now, have you seen, we were talking about Uber earlier, kind of the last segment I had was, you know, Uber's getting into the delivery business these days of delivering food and packages and that kind of stuff. Have you seen anybody doing yep. meals on wheels through uh, alternative or through the ridership program? Well, we, we, have, we actually support Meals on Wheels programs, okay. and um, I didn't talk about any of it. I didn't touch on it um, because it's the whole segment in itself. But a Meals on Wheels program is fundamentally different than providing rides because typically the way a Meals on Wheels program works is you have one volunteer that will deliver n number of meals to, you know, I mean, I, it happens that personally I volunteer for my local Meals on Wheels programs on Fridays, and I have 15 or 16 people on my route. Um, so the way that you schedule is very different than when, when you're scheduling for a ride, uh, but we support that. And um, there's also pantry programs, which is really more or less the same thing. It, it, there are organizations that make up uh, uh, bags of groceries, the, the staples of life, uh, you know, and you deliver them out to people so that they can, you know, it's rice and, and macaroni and cheese or whatever it used to be, that kind of thing. So they can do, the, you know, at least they get the food that they need. Uh, so we support those kinds of programs also. Um, uh, Uber is getting in more into the you know, oh, I'm hungry. I think I'll call Taco Bell and have, you know, my tacos delivered by Uber or something. Right. Uh, that's kind of a little different. It's not, it's not what we're going. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll get there. Yeah, okay. That was the There's less. enough on the plate as it is. There's enough that we're trying to do right now that uh, we don't need to go. <laughs> down that road right now. All right, a couple more things. I will let you go. I appreciate all your sure. time. I really do. Um, I, went to a, uh, I went to a seminar in our county uh, a month or so ago, and I was impressed so much by the data that they just have, demographics, income, geez, it's almost like you name it, and they can okay. give you a analysis of people in our county. Um, right. So if I went to them and said, here is a typical demographic profile for riders that are in the assisted rides kind of program, what would that demographics look like that I could give to them that they in turn could tell me where most of these people are living within our county? Well, there's, there's um, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, one of them is if we go back to the 27 report, let me run this. Um, there's a couple of pieces of information that are that are quite useful to understand. Um, you know, if you look at this, 20% are male, 79%, well, 80% really are female. That's very typical of across the board because women live longer than men and um, that's just the nature of the beast. And then when you look down here at the age distribution, you can see, you know, once you get into, uh, you know, 70 to 74 is 12 percent, 75 to 79 is 15, the 80 to 84 is 15, 85 to 90. So you can see, you know, this is skewing way towards the elderly uh, in, in terms of the demographics. The uh, relationship status, um, uh, you know, this shows you the breakdown of, you know, that um, what their living situation is. You can see this here. Um, so, you know, we're, pro you know, I guess I'm, you're asking, and this is a question that, that I've carried around for a long time, 
I'll tell you, if you can find somebody who can do the math and come up with, you know, okay, based on the census of our county, um, this is how many people are in these age ranges. This is the economic situation of these people. Statistically, you can forecast that, you know, we've got whatever the number is. Uh, 400,000 people live in this county, and probably of those, uh, 35,000 of them desperately need a program like this because you can just do the math. You, you, can, you can look at the ages, you can look at the uh, demographics, uh, and you can calculate, you know, this is what you can expect. Um, is the number of people, and I don't know what that number is. I mean, that, I would love for somebody to, 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 you know, come back to me and say, oh, we worked it out. Here are the data elements that you need to plug in. Here's the formula, and this will spit out how many people you can expect need this kind of service. Uh, and Eventually, you could drill down to the zip code where they live, and you could then, you know, build up a, a map to show here's where your likely candidates are. I would love to see something like that. I have not yet got anybody who's done it because it's a lot of work uh, to try and figure that out. Well, I'll tell you, these guys, that given that criteria of what you just outlined here in this, what do you call it, 27 report? Is that what this is? Yeah, 27 right. report. Um, right. I, I think I could have a conversation with these guys, and based upon their experience of this kind of analysis for their for the variety of social service programs in our county, I'm going to go have that conversation with them. I think these guys are pretty sharp, and they've got tons of data, in, and not just in terms of uh, zip code, but they can drill right. it down to uh, you know street addresses or within two or three blocks kind of right. thing. So uh, right. I'm going to go right. back to them and say, hey, here's what we got. Tell me where our potential clientele is, and let's agree upon what that criteria yeah. might be. Um, they'll get it. Listen, if, if you want to have a three-way conversation, I'd love to, uh, okay. you know, participate. Uh, you know, there's another piece of information which is not reflected here. Uh, we don't require it, but we, we can capture it for those that want to, which is, there is, in the census data, there is um, uh, a thing called population density. And basically, it's a simple way of being able to determine who's living in a rural community, because it's all based on, you know, the, the population per square mile. So, you know, if you, you are, you know, less than this number, you're considered rural. Right. If you're between this number and this number, you're considered suburban. If you're above this number, you're in urban setting. Um, and that's another factor that can play in trying to figure out where is where are the potential clients. Um, that, that's real easy to do because... Um, um, a lot of grant money is based upon where you are in that exactly. in the category. So exactly. I, exactly. That's what I was going to say. A lot of grant money is driven based on the, popul the, 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 density, the population density factor. Yep. So I, we have a set of buckets where you can capture that information. Most of my organizations don't, but um, I, you know, I'd really love to, you know. Uh, if, if, they, if you can get a conversation with them, I'd love to participate if that's an opportunity and yeah, kind of see what we can come up with. Yep, you bet. We'll, we'll do that. All, All right, right. Let's see. A couple of things. I keep saying this. Um, for, an, for your, How many organizations have you got involved in this? How many clients? <laughs> Several hundred. I forget. What's yeah, a, something like that. Yeah. What's a typical staffing organization look like? Right now, we've got an organization that's got an executive director and, you know, a couple of part-time people working on this thing. 
I've, I've asked him to go back yep. and say, tell, tell me, without having any constraints of money, time, people, or whatever, give me an organization chart for the ideal, perfect uh, organization that we need to create in order to have a sustainable, viable, successful program. What would you think? Okay, so uh, a, a lot of our organizations literally come down to there's an ED, uh, an executive director, right. and there's one part-time assistant that gets, you know, paid for 20 hours or 24 hours a, a week or something, uh, and then they rely on uh, volunteers who come into the office and answer phone calls and that sort of thing. Um, you can do that. We, you can do that up until you reach about, I would say, five thousand to seven thousand rides um, a year. Uh, after that, you got to start putting some muscle on the bone. Um, you just it is too much going on um, to to run it elsewhere or, you know, otherwise. Um, so the, the question becomes, you know, okay, how many rides do you expect your program to be providing in the first year or something and, you know, um, try and figure out what you would need. I, I, I don't know whether I'm answering your question directly, but that's uh, generally the way I usually see things happening. Uh, as they get more successful and then they're doing 10,000 rides and everything, then the money starts to flow because uh, they're, they're making an impact on the community and then they can hire, you know, the second assistant and the first assistant comes full time and, and uh, they, they grow from there. Um, well, just but in, just the other in, thing that is, is a consideration is, is this part of a larger organization? Uh, is it part of an organization that already exists, that is already doing things, and this is just one more thing that they're going to be doing, in which case then you get into, you know, well, um, I think that we could run this for the first six months with one person dedicating 40% of their time or something out of our staff of eight something like that. You, you follow what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the reality is, you know, that's mediocre at best and well, just doesn't uh, happen. <laughs> you know. and, well, it, it, you know, the most important thing that you need, honestly, is commitment. Right. They need to be committed to the program, to making the program a success because you know, it's not just the scheduling of rides, it's all the other things, going out to the community, speaking to groups, you know, soliciting sponsorship, uh, you know, all of that stuff to, to make the program successful. I'll tell you, I, a couple of months ago in April, I went to um, Tennessee. In Tennessee, um, got a very special thing going on where um, a couple of years ago there was a lawsuit um, against a, a corporation that owned some assisted living facilities scattered around Tennessee and they got sued by the state for elderly abuse and the state won. There was a big settlement with 30 plus million dollars uh, in this settlement and the stipulation was okay here's this pile of money but it has to be used to improve the lives of seniors and so there were a lot of different organizations around the state of Tennessee that submitted proposals on how they would spend some of this money to improve the lives of seniors there was one uh, that called the SVPN, the Senior Volunteer Transportation Network, that uh, won a chunk of the money, not nearly as much as they had hoped, but it was 
about uh, about three million dollars, I think, or something like that. Um, and what they've done is they've now created. There are currently 19 different organizations that are running assisted rides programs around the state of Tennessee. That's going to grow to 30 or so in the next 12 months or so, and they're having this huge impact on transportation issues in the state of Tennessee. Uh, and it's very exciting to, to be working with them. Um, you know, so there's possibilities out there, but, you know, it took somebody to have a real commitment to make this happen. And, um, you know, that's what they're doing. It was really exciting to be in. We, we spent a couple of days with them, you know, doing some on-site training and, and then listening to them, learning what they're doing, how they're doing it, everything. Um, really neat really need to be working with them. Actually, that's you and I had our first conversation when you were leaving that, and I've since talked to several of the oh. organizations down there in Tennessee, and yeah, they're they're pumped up. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. No, that's all right. It's good to hear this synopsis again. Yeah. Um, so obviously, in the organizations I talked with in Tennessee, the challenge is, of course, getting volunteers and Frankly, I went on your website and saw a lot of resources there of people that have really done some great stuff in terms of articulating both the challenges as well as the solutions for uh, gaining volunteers. So I, I don't think we need to go over that, but I just wanted to compliment you for putting that on your website. I appreciate it. Um, well, there is one thing that I will mention about that that uh, is we will be uh, – rolling out sometime in the next couple of months or so. There is a uh, company, they used to be called Verified Volunteer. They have just recently changed their name to Sterling Volunteers. Um, and they do background checks um, for, uh, on volunteers. You know, a lot of, you know, if you're going to put an 86-year-old lady in a car with, you know, some guy or something, uh, you need to do a background check. I mean, that's just is a given. Um, and, and so we, years ago, were able to approach them and explain what, a, what was our business and, uh, and that, you know, we have 10,000 volunteers uh, in our program. You ought to be nice to us. And so the initial thing was um, we negotiated a discount for their services. So if you are an assisted ride program and you want to run your background checks through Sterling Volunteers, uh, we give you a contact and then you get a discount for their services. We don't get any money out of the, out of the deal. It's just something that we were able to do on behalf of our clients. But where I wanted to go was the fact that Sterling Volunteers has several million people that they brought background checks on in their database. And in many cases, these are people who would like to find other ways that they could volunteer in their community. And so we started a project a couple of months ago with Sterling where uh, our clients will be able to think of it as doing job posting. They, they can do posting that, oh, we're in Brown County, Tennessee, and we need uh, volunteers. And people who have had a background check done by Sterling uh, volunteers have a portal where they can log in and they can view all of the uh, volunteer opportunities in their community. And so we don't know what to expect out of this, but it's one more way that we're trying to help these organizations find volunteers by partnering with Sterling Volunteers to offer this feature. Uh, hopefully I explained that okay. Yeah, you know no, I got it, That's, that sounds really cool. Now, is, is the Verify Volunteers no longer in existence and they're just transitioned over to Verify Volunteers? Well, Verify Volunteers simply changed their name. They, they announced 
about a month ago that they they were simply changing their name. And the honest answer, you know, the, the back story is that there has, there was for, there has been for years a sterling, I don't know whether they have another name or not, but there was a, there is a company called Sterling that does background checks. Uh, they've been around for decades. And about a decade ago or so, they decided that they would create a subsidiary targeting specifically doing background checks for volunteer programs. So they had the whole infrastructure in place to do background checks. They just decided they would create this subsidiary that was uh, market focused on volunteer program. Um, so they created verified volunteer. Now, 10 years or plus later, I don't know what their reasoning is, but for whatever reason, they have decided to brand it as Sterling Volunteers. Probably wanted to take advantage of the fact that Sterling is a well-known background check program already. But anyway, so verified volunteers still exist. It's now just called Sterling Volunteers. Got it. All right, last two things is, um, I think I read in a variety of things, the volunteer to rider ratio. What has been in your experience with that? That one is really easy. Um, in fact, you don't even need me to figure it out. If you take a look at our demographic page, lo and behold, it's a four to one ratio. Okay. It's right there. You know, 44,775 clients, 10,719 volunteers. I would suggest that you want to try and try for about a three to one ratio. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and it's, I, I find this fascinating because these ratios don't seem to move very much. Uh, you know, the mileage is almost, you know, it's, it's just about 10 miles per ride. You can figure that out by just looking at this. 2.7 million rides, 25, almost 26 million miles driven. Um, yeah, I find this, and this is nationwide over a span of 10 years, so you're pretty solid. There's it, not too many surprises there, you know? I mean, when you get down to an individual program, you might have real exceptions because they're rural and they're driving miles and miles and miles more than others, but you know, this gives you a pretty good idea. Uh, all right. Um, what's been your experience with paying drivers? <clears throat> We're organizations that are paying drivers. I can't get volunteers. I guess we're going to have to pay them something. Right. What, what's been well, your... That... Okay, so... Um, uh, you all... I feel... This is for me personally, I feel like you want to be very careful with that because you get people with the wrong motivation. And, you know, that can be... That's something you want to make sure that you're you're paying attention to. Uh, but I actually will tell you a little story. Um, you know, I, I've described how we have this feature called self-volunteering that allows volunteers to log in and they can look at the list of pending rides, they can pick one, they can assign it to themselves. And we're very proud of that. We think that's a nifty little feature. Uh, we rolled it out. And about six weeks later, I got a phone call from one of my clients. And they said, Mark, um, this self-assigning business is causing us a problem. And I said, really? What's the problem? He said, well, we reimburse our drivers to the tune of 50 cents a mile. And frankly, we have quite a few retired people that are basically subsidizing their social security check 
by doing lots of driving for us to the tune that we're issuing checks of $400, $500 a month to some of these people. And what's happening is that now with self-assigning, we have some people out there that are sitting at their computer all day long and they keep hitting the refresh button and as soon as a new ride appears, they grab it and they assign it to themselves. And now I've got volunteers that are really pissed because they're not getting their fair share. <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay, I did not see that coming. <laughs> I just, like, okay, um, well, let me think about this. So there's actually another feature in assisted rides called self volunteering and it allows it works the same way but the volunteer can log in they can select their ride and they can volunteer for it but it does not assign the ride to them what happens is that in the office that ride turns red on the calendar and when they click on it they can see who has volunteered and you have two or three or four different people who have volunteered for this ride and it lets the office control which one they assign it to. And that's how we resolve that problem. So <laughs> it is something that um, does work. One thing I will tell you from my experience is that we have a number of organizations that will tell their you know, prospective volunteers, we will reimburse you whatever, 25 cents a mile, 50 cents a mile, 14 cents a mile, whatever it is that your organization settles on. And one of the things that I see a lot is when a person signs up to be a volunteer, they will ask them the question, do you want to be reimbursed? for the ride that you provide. And what a lot of organizations have experienced is that only about a third of the volunteers who sign up that say, yes, I want to be reimbursed. Two thirds of them will look at you and say, I'm volunteering because I think it's a good thing to do. I, I'm, I'm not looking to be paid for these rides. So take that with, you know, piece of information about what what I've seen in terms of, of the experience that organizations who do reimburse. It is a function of how much you reimburse. Uh, my goodness, if you're reimbursing at the tune of 50 cents a mile, I might even take you up on that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I find that to be pretty spicy, but okay. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point you brought into that. Um, frankly, just having put a lot of miles on for nonprofit organizations, and sometimes they used to uh, compensate me. I mean, you make a lot of money putting in expenses on mileage. I think, frankly, I think the average mileage, fully allocated mileage cost is about 50 cents anyway, so I don't know if you're debting anything out, but anyway, I get it. Right. I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we do support if you want to reimburse. And, and there's a flag that you said if the person does not want to be reimbursed. And one of the things we provide is you can generate a um, statement for each volunteer that will show them the rides they provided, how many miles they drove, and everything. And that, that can be quite useful both for reimbursing purposes if they do want to get reimbursed. Uh, you print off the statement and, and send it with the check so they know how you arrived at this amount. But a lot of or, uh, or volunteers, even if they don't get reimbursed, want the statement because they can have it for their tax purposes. Right. You know, um, so they can um, show the mileage. I asked you about demographics for riders, but how about just demographics for drivers, volunteers? Uh, we have some of that. Um, I can tell you that the bulk of uh, uh, Drivers are retired themselves. Um, it just makes sense. Yeah. Um, but 
we're not as rigorous about collecting information. I mean, they, organizations can collect all of that information and it's in the database. Um, I don't know that we had a report like the 27, the agency snapshot report that, that focuses on uh, volunteers, but all the data is there. We could, we could produce that if we needed to. Um, I'm not as confident that uh, they rigorously collect all that information on volunteers. I mean, I think they're, you know, happy to just have somebody show up to volunteer and, you know, asking them their ethnicity and uh, their living situation and their relationship status. I'm not sure whether they always collect that information. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I understand. I mean, I... <clears throat> I live in a 55 and older community, and you know I, I see this as a huge opportunity for volunteers. And yet, sure. <laughs> people are really busy. You know, newly retired people get really busy really quick with family, grandkids, catching up, travel, all that stuff. Yep. And so, oh yeah, I'm not yep. sure that demographic of let's say 55 to 65 is, or maybe to 68 is. A, a real good resource for capturing volunteers. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just a thought. All right. Last question is: uh, What have I, what have I not asked that I should be asking? Well, you know, I, I've, I've, in all of our exchanges and everything, I, there's a piece of me that I'm still trying to figure out: What is your role in all of this? I mean, um, what is it that you're trying to get to? Um, I know that you, you know, you, you're talking to this uh, nonprofit and that they're struggling. They don't have money. They're trying to do programs, but you know, they don't have money. And, um, but it sounds like you have a bigger vision, and um, I, you know, I. I I felt that I, I, I feel like I don't quite understand exactly what you're trying to get to. Um, what, what is your, you know, long-term vision of where you're trying to take this stuff? It's one thing to help out a, uh, an organization that's floundering and, you know, desperate for money and everything, but I keep, from things that you say, I get the sense that you have a bigger vision in mind, and I was kind of about that. Um, the sole purpose is, frankly, to create a viable, sustainable, um, robust transportation system that works for people in our com in our area. Um, there's been, right. you know, I think I might have mentioned this to you, maybe to Jeremy, but you know, I I work a lot and have worked a lot for many years with the, the Rotary International Organization. Uh, both at right. the local level as well as international. And one of the powerful tools that I have seen used and have taught many, many clubs, uh, local clubs to use is what's called it, we call it a community needs assessment. Sit down with the community leaders and just have a conversation with right. them at, as to what's missing in their communities. Not necessarily what's wrong, it's just a matter of what's missing that if we put them right. in place would take those things that are not working and put them over in the working category. Um, and so in our particular area, I mean, we, we've been through that and uh, did that last year and came up with the categories of housing or lack of affordable housing in our particular area. Uh, child care was another major category, especially preschool child care and the others right. in the job training to some degree, and then uh, transportation. And yep. Um, yep. so as a result of that transportation, we have the fixed route systems that exist here, but the consensus is that they're not working well. I mean, they're there and they're right. kind of right. working, but certainly just getting to them sometimes is a barrier. If you got somebody who lives three miles away from the next stop, that's not working because they can't get that three miles. So, um, right. and right. I've lived in this area for a long time and I've been through many of these kinds of conversations with local nonprofits 
and uh, you know, the same categories come up. And um, right. as an example of that, we started, I, I helped start the Family Promise. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but there's an organization around the country called Family Promise that helps family homelessness. And so we brought in a chapter. Right. We brought in a chapter here locally with that, found staffed it appropriately, raised money for it, and it's just doing wonderful stuff and is really helping to alleviate, and that's a key word, alleviate family homelessness right. in our area. We're never going right. to eliminate it, but at least we can alleviate it. Right. And right. that evolved right. from conversations in the community around that issue, and after a while, you know, you just get tired of talking about it. And you got to get into action and actually do something. And right. my view of it and, and the topic and the category of transportation is exactly the same. We've been talking about this mm -hmm. forever, but really right. Right. no good solution that is sustainable, robust, vibrant, whatever you want, right. word you want to call it, basically working really well right. for those that are impacted. So um, somehow we... I guess I've heard of this system that is called Zoom by Family Services mm -hmm. here. And I thought, well, that seems to be logical. I mean, basically, it's just an inexpensive right. Uber-type system that would work really well. So right. I went up and talked to them and said, okay, here's what it is. And when I saw the, your software there, I go, well, duh, you got the structure in place here. Uh, <laughs> what What's missing that it's not working? And what's missing is... Uh, Commitment a little bit on your part, uh, on their part, right. but uh, the usual nonprofit lack of resources to uh, in terms know, I, I, of people uh, money. I, uh, right. Um, it's funny because I really do think that um, assisted ride is, I think, so beneficial to uh, organizations like this that are wanting to do, you know, good and, and wanting to, you know, for, you know, fill a, a, a ditch in, in, the, in, in the community um, because it does give you structure. I mean, it, you've watched me go through assisted rides and, you know, I talk about how, you know, when you get a phone call, you want to go to their profile, you want to schedule the ride, you know, it tracks all of this stuff and everything. And, and it really helps bring focus uh, to the process. And then with the, you know, I always joke that, you know, you know, an organization has to go through a certain amount of pain because they got to get their data in the system. They got to get their clients, their destinations, their volunteers in the system. And, but then they start using it and they have a, an aha moment when they go, oh, this is much easier to schedule rides and to track rides than, than the way we were doing it before. But their real aha moment is when they get to the end of the first month or the end of the first quarter and, you know, that report that they used to spend three days trying to cobble together from post-it notes uh, <laughs> is at their fingertips, you know, with a click of a button. And suddenly, they can get the attention of the regional transportation agency and show them in real terms the impact that they're having on the community or, you know, the, the grocery store chain or the medical establishment. Um, it, it brings so much data together and makes the process, it, it, it gives you that structure that is so needed by a lot of these organizations that they, they have every good intention in the world, but, you know, they need structure, and, and assisted rides actually ends up providing that. I hope that makes sense. No, it's exactly right, exactly right. And yeah. so you get, you have an operational component that's needed here. You've got, obviously, a, uh, a marketing component to communicate and right. en enroll people in volunteering, as well as letting right, potential riders out there know that this service is available. Um, and there's right. a development, meaning fundraising component, from whatever sources those are, whether that's the writers, whether it's right. sponsors, whether it's governmental. So I view it as a total strategy, but ultimately, everything I've seen so far says 
This is a viable solution that can be a small, but not tiny, <laughs> but a relatively small yeah. organization can uh, create and be very sustainable for the long term. Right now, they're tiny, and they just we got to get them out of that, and they're constrained by money yeah. and everything else. So. Right. All right, man. I'll let you well, go. You spent two hours with me, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm gonna go off and have some lunch now. I'll be <laughs> two hours late. But <laughs> no problem. Well, uh, appreciate it, and I uh, hope that uh, you'll come back and we'll uh, we'll we'll be able to do something together. Okay. Yeah, that's really great, and um, I just want to thank you so much for you know all your support and all the time that you've committed to us and helped us with. Um, 